Hello and welcome to another Royal Society publishing video podcast. Today I'm here with Peter Coveney from UCL and Peter Hunter from the University of Auckland. I'll be asking them questions about computational biomedicine, which was the theme of a recent interface focus issue, which both Peters contributed to and helped to organise. The term computational biomedicine is relatively new, but what do we actually mean by it? Computational science uh, represents uh, the advancement of science through the use of computers. So too, uh, computational biomedicine means advancing the biomedical field through the use of computers. So in a sense, it's a very wide term and becoming in increasingly prevalent today. The role of information technology uh, manifested in all areas from the life sciences to medicine, e-health, and right into a clinical context. It's now becoming a very big issue. How we handle that interface between science, the medical, the clinical world, and people in the street is what this subject is largely about. I think there's two major thrusts at the moment. One is the connection of physiology down towards molecular events. So we've had 50 years of a molecular biology revolution that's given us an enormous database of protein structure, protein function, genomics, genes, genetics. Um, and I think our ability to link that information in an integrative sense into models of physiological function, where often structure and function together dictate the physiological level um, function, is one of our major challenges. And then another one is linking physiological function to medicine, to be able to make use of models that are personalised and um, combining population data with background scientific knowledge of various aspects of physiology, but making it relevant to an individual in the clinic as part of a diagnostic or treatment strategy. Can you tell us about the Virtual Physiological Human Initiative, its aims and some of its objectives? Specifically, the Virtual Physiological Human Initiative has been uh, one that's been funded by the European Union in what's called Framework Programme 7 that's run over the past seven years or so. It's been worth around 200 million euros. Scientifically, what we've found most exciting about it is that it simply uh, promotes the use of modelling and simulation methods that have been developed largely hitherto in the physical science and engineering, now into the context of uh, not just the life sciences but the medical area and in, indeed into the clinical context. So what we're talking about now is using these capabilities in a kind of technological way to assist in the understanding of medicine, turning it more into a science perhaps than it has been, and with the possibility of clinical impact on a personalised basis. One can have personalised data on someone running a simulation ahead of taking a clinical decision. Potentially this is a very powerful new way of assisting treatments. The papers in this issue of Interface Focus are a selection of those presented at the second of two conferences organised by this initiative. Um, can you tell us the purpose of the conference and some of its outcomes? Well, I think there's a developing community that these meetings provide a very effective way of people sharing strategies and results. Um, both meetings have been, I think, great in terms of building a community around computational physiology, computational medicine. Um, the next one's going to be in Trondheim in 2014, so we're holding them every two years. And I think they are going to attract an increasing number of people that are at that interface between uh, mathematical modelling and biology and physiology. Um, and they, they've become a, a very important focus for the, this emerging discipline of computational biology. And how has this translated into an issue of focus? What have been the emerging themes and do you have any favourite topics? The way, the way the issue was developed is, is a, a blueprint we successfully uh, utilised in the first conference, which was also published in Interface Focus in 2011. That is quite a rigorous selection based initially on abstracts and then peer review handled by the journal to select uh, the best papers that came out of the meeting. And uh, those were just chosen on the basis of their scientific quality. Standing back after the papers have been selected and put into the issue, you can see uh, various 
trends developing. I mean, one of the strengths has always been historically before the VPH, Virtual Physiological Human Initiative, got going was in terms of cardiac modeling. And so the cardiovascular area has been quite a strong one, and it was probably the dominant theme in the 2011 issue. This one in 2013 is beginning to show evidence of a lot of other activity in, in different disciplines, different areas. I think my favorite examples of in this area are always where there's an iteration between model development and experiment, where the models are informing how to do the right experiments and how to interpret the data, and then the, the iteration that goes on between experiment and modeling can be very exciting to watch. And I think it's happening now across a, a wide range of um, particular tissue or cell or organ uh, types of experiment. What's actually involved in researching computational biomedicine? And what challenges do scientists face? Indeed, the area is enormous when you start looking at it. And uh, this is, as I've said in several talks, titles of talks I give, it's an agenda for the 21st century. We're only at the beginning of something here. And clearly the human body, never mind the whole of physiology, medicine and so on, it's in incredibly complicated. So one could continue to study many things at greater levels of depth with more and more sophisticated models. But this is tempered by the requirement to uh, engage with a clinical outcome, what we call the translational agenda, taking science and medicine into a clinical context. One of the challenges is to make sure that we achieve reproducible modeling science. So we need to be able to develop infrastructure for mathematical modeling in biology and medicine, which allows you to someone other than the person who's developed the model to be able to reproduce the results from that model. I would say it's the biggest challenge in computational science to be able to handle in a facile way uh, secure private information, but to be able to deploy it on resources that may be computational infrastructure that can all then lead to outcomes, say simulation model-based outcomes that inform a clinical decision. Those have to be done on timescales that are relevant to clinicians, not to the usual jobbing scientist. So it really is a big challenge. So three areas of research have been identified as future priorities. The digital patient in silico clinical trials and personal health forecasting. Can you tell us a little bit about each one of those? Yes, um, the digital patient one would see as an extension of the current virtual physiological human agenda taking it into increasingly the applied context of clinical scenarios, being able to furnish a clinical environment, say a clinical decision support environment, that's easy to use and produces the results, as I was saying earlier, in a timely fashion. In silico clinical trials is, again, uh, slightly different in the sense that we're talking about how we manage uh, information on patients in cohorts that need to be sufficiently large to be able to draw sensible scientific and clinical conclusions. But now, not just what we would historically call data-centric approaches, but being able to make models for the individuals based on the patient data for themselves and the others. And uh, the last thing, which is pa patient health forecasting or something for that effect, well, in that case, I mean, ultimately, you, you can probably understand this is be going beyond patients. It, t it speaks to all of us in a general context. Imagine in a very few years' time, just uh, your own h whole human genome can be sequenced, will be sequenced for of the order of 100 pounds. I mean, it will be something that everyone can have. And the acquisition of that information, where you put it and how you use it, is something that's relevant to every single one of us. It's no longer going to be just a medical patient-related thing. It'll influence lifestyle choices and such things as that. So that's the major, very long-term agenda here. So how close are we to having our own clinical avatar? I think closer than you think. Um, I think we could now, for example, produce an avatar of you that looked exactly like you and it took several viewings to tell that it wasn't your face. And you could use it for ordering clothes and, and so on and at a superficial level. I think the adding depth to that in terms of real physiological detail that's relevant to your state of health 
is going to take a lot longer, but I think we will see quite a few applications of that emerging over the next few years, and I would be optimistic that it will become a basis for really guiding your own healthcare in the future within 10 years. Thank you both for taking part and thank you for watching.